thank you, um, everybody, or the discussants for the for the comments. Um, um, I don't have much to respond to. I think all of the points that you made are are um, are, are excellent. I particularly like the the point about thinking about the natural resource sector sector as being kind of an upstream sector that can feed into a more complex manufacturing base and it's something I'm going to definitely give some thought to um, in the times to come. But what I'll do is I'll hand over for maybe first to John to respond to some of the comments and then maybe you can respond. Um, yeah, thank you for the comments. Uh, very useful. Um, I will make it a lot of the questions you had, uh, points taken and uh, I would say that it's something that we need to look uh, deeper into. I will just uh, take a couple of them. Um, there's no doubt about that this uh, issue of uh, distinguishing between intermediates and final goods production, uh, what the MEs are doing uh, in Asia versus in Africa, is something that we are currently uh, studying uh, more intensively. Um, there is Clearly, a tendency in the data that we have focused on that the MEs they pr uh, produce more intermediates for local markets in Asia than in Africa, and but it's not entirely clear what is the higher value added uh, part of the production. Uh, that is something that is uh, puzzling us a little bit. Uh, that uh, there is a lot of vi uh, variation in uh, the value added, added gain of. Uh, in, in, engaging in different types of production in Africa. Uh, whereas in Asia, it's a, a very clear that both the learning effects uh, differ uh, in terms of whether you produce intermediates or uh, final goods product, uh, products. In Africa, we see very a large variation across uh, uh, countries, whether they do one or the other. So my it's, the point is taken, the reason why we may not have highlighted it more is because we are still looking into this issue and hopefully we can give you a more uh, solid answer in a year or two on that. Um, about the contractual arrangements, um, I've been doing some work also with Carol and uh, Nita Trifkovic and others on these uh, matters of uh, contracting arrangements, mostly in Vietnam, I have to say. Um, and these uh, local content elements um, there's no doubt about that the, there is a, it reduces from the point of view of the m and having a contractual arrangement also in terms of um, technology transfer. Uh, in order to get some of the contracts, they need to sign the contracts of technology transfers in Africa more than they do in Asia. That is one thing that is clear from some of the work we did in Ghana uh, um, and compared to Vietnam. Second of all, we also see that a lot of the MEs they actually required this themselves in order to reduce risk in terms of committing the local producers to the engagement. They are more inclined to demand this kind of contract with local producers in this case, Ghana, uh, as compared to Vietnam, where most of the MEs going into Vietnam do not have a demand of a contractual arrangement uh, when they enter. They will actually find the most efficient producers after they enter in Vietnam. Uh, so, whereas they will not even establish the foreign affiliate in Ghana before they have this contractual arrangement settled before entering. So, this is something that there is a clear difference witness uh, in this case, and we need to figure out why that is. And most of the MEs we have been talking to are saying that they they see Ghana as a much more risky investment than they experience in, Cam than in Cambodia or Vietnam, even within the same sectors. Even in sectors, for example, rubber, where Ghana is doing quite well internationally, uh, they, we still see that they have a comparative advantage as compared to Vietnam, but we still see the MEs demanding these contractual arrangements more frequently in Ghana than in Vietnam before entering. Um, I guess it's something to do with perceived risk that we may uh, need to reduce. Thank you very much for your um, question. Uh, actually, in this presentation, I tried to focus more on the main agglomeration mechanisms at work, uh, notably input sharing, uh, which, makes, uh, which increases efficiency of uh, firms when they locate near their input suppliers, labor market pooling, and knowledge spillovers. 
but as for um, uh, incentives given by the government to push firms to concentrate in a given region, uh, we can see this in service industries. I will come to this later. But uh, we also can see that indirectly in the concentration of agro-food firms, uh, especially in the case of the governorate of Sfax, uh, where, as I mentioned in slides, that uh, given the high financial capacities of its investors, um, Sfaxian investors could uh, benefit or exploit economic policies which provide subsidies to encourage the cattle farming sector in which Sfax is largely specialized despite the fact Sfax has no natural cost advantages. It has, no, it has very poor grazing land to be specialized in this um, uh, manufacturing sector. But um, uh, so far to my knowledge, um, the capital of uh, Tunisia, uh, Tunis, the administrative capital, uh, there, there are incentives uh, given by the government to impulse specialization in uh, service uh, industries in Tunisia. Uh, and uh, to, um, uh, to push in some way uh, firms to relocate, especially manufacturing firms to relocate from uh, the capital Tunis because uh, Tunis, as you know, it's the first central business district. It is a large town and uh, it uh, exhibits these economies quite common to this kind of, uh, of, uh, of towns uh, traduced by uh, shortages, shortage of uh, industrial sites, the high costs, uh, high land and housing prices. And uh, so uh, the government now tries to um, uh, impulse specialization in high added value manufacturing industries such as electric and electronic industries. They're in, in, in their way to do this. I hope that I answered your question. Thank you. Thanks for that. I just also maybe add on the um, kind of when it says question about agglomeration in government policy, we did do a, quite a large body of work on that. Um, I've done some work with, with John Page, we've produced a paper and then um, also with Abel, um, who's here somewhere too. And um, it's very variable in terms of how effective government policies are in terms of um, establishing special economic zones. They play a role, but what we uncovered in, in, in many cases is just really ineffective <coughs> government policies and the need for much more coherence and transparency in how these zones are set up. Um, in comparison with Vietnam, where it, it seems to work quite effectively in terms of offering incentives for firms to establish in special economic zones. They're very effective in attracting FDI and in sustaining levels of FDI in those zones. So there's, it's very variable, and I think that there is more research needed into exactly how effective these government policies are in terms of the transparency and so on. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Peter Quote from the University of Ghana. I think I have enjoyed all the presentations. Um, I just have a quick comment to make on FDI and technology transfer. Um, most often we find technology transfer or FDI moving into the extractive industries, um, mining, oil. So it would be interesting if you could disaggregate your results, I mean, if you could take out the extractives. Are we going to see different results? Um, I think we should um, look into that. Then also, if you take countries like South Africa, Nigeria, I mean, these are the major countries that attract FDI. Perhaps if you could take them out, what pattern are we going to observe? Thank you very much. I think this has been a really excellent uh, discussion. I just want to pick up on the point that uh, I think, John, you made around the uh, uh, FDI and the, the challenges of sort of enclave uh, development. I think certainly what you're seeing in uh, southern Africa particularly, there's been, there has been a big drive around uh, local content legislation, but it's been very rough. So typically it'll be, you know, they'll slap on a 30 or 40 percent local content provision, uh, and it might be in oil and gas or mining or whatever, but it's not being enforced. There's not the uh, institutional or government capability to enforce it. Um, and there's not the, there aren't the companies there that can, can really get there. But I think this is a big trend that's going to continue. 
So certainly uh, we've done some work or commissioned work around the role of supermarkets, South African supermarkets in the region, and these probably provide quite low-hanging areas of opportunity for, for local suppliers to build up capabilities to get in. Um, but I think it really brings in the area, uh, an important focus needs to be around the capacity of government to, to manage this, uh, uh, and perhaps understanding the types of policies that can be put in place to really encourage this uh, a lot further. Um, and it is a huge, I think it is a huge challenge uh, at the moment how this is going to be done. And then I think perhaps looking at how uh, one then moves to uh, building up local capability that can then move into, into an export type uh, you know, some of these firms as they expand and, and hopefully fill this gap of the missing middle uh, and can then hopefully move into more of an export type uh, uh, role. So I think uh, this is a really critical area of, of, of work that needs to probably a lot more investigation as to what the policy tools are that uh, can be employed to, to do this. But at the moment, I think it's too rough, too blunt, uh, uh, there isn't the capability there, and it's certainly not working well. Um, so I think it's a, a very rich area, but perhaps some comments on that. I had one question which is based on the presentation by Carol. Um, I haven't read the paper, so maybe it's in the full paper, but somewhere you mentioned that a large determining factor of success of industries in Africa exporting was the born global. Uh, do I understand with that that it is uh, industries which are owned by the diaspora, by Indian, Greek, Lebanese, etc., or is there another uh, definition of that? If the first assumption is right, what are the policies to, to uh, emphasize of the um, born uh, non-global uh, 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 industrialist? Thank you. Yeah, um, Peter's uh, comment on... Uh, we. We haven't looked into, we started out by looking at manufacturing sector uh, just to limit our scope a little bit. There's no doubt about that it would be nice to expand the analysis to the extractive uh, industries and look a little bit deeper into how the linkages are to the local economy. Uh, I think some of our work in South Africa currently is uh, going to uh, look deeper into this. Um, and there's no doubt about uh, Nigeria, I, I have some uh, PhD students who have tried uh, uh, utilizing the data, but the data quality has not been good enough actually to fac facilitate the type of analysis that we carry out in this. In terms of the challenges of the enclave econ uh, economies, um, there's no doubt about this with the lack of enforcement of the local content. Um, I currently have a PhD student lo looking into this in the extractive industries, actually. And um, the lack, basically, they are on purpose uh, violating uh, laws and uh, just paying the fines. And, uh, and it doesn't really matter for the next contract uh, that they bid for. Um, it, most of the times, the gov there is a government involvement also in the bid uh, for these ex uh, by these ex uh, extractive uh, industries and uh, the companies so there's clearly uh, something about the capacity of government but also that government may be too involved in some of these uh, extractive industries to actually facilitate enforcing uh, this local content element um, it's a big discussion about privatization of uh, extractive uh, industries. Um, there's no doubt about that uh, more enforcement is needed on this local content element, also in terms of creating jobs for uh, local people. I had a quite a, uh, George is also sitting here, uh, a study in uh, uh, Ghana where we looked into uh, whether they live up to the uh, local content elements in uh, Tagorati area. And, uh, Basically, we had to stop the study, more or less, or because we concluded that everything that was in the report was not reflecting the truth in the field. So that was, uh, yeah, you're m very much right, but it was uh, basically government-created uh, data uh, that was uh, providing the evidence for living up to the local content, and that was not really in accordance with the data we collected from uh, local firms and their MEs. So there is... Clearly, this issue of um, uh, 
government enforcement and government capacity. With regarding the supermarkets, that is interesting. Um, as far as I know, you may correct me, that the effect of supermarkets on the local value chain uh, from domestic producers, it hasn't been the success that we expected. There, it's still, it's still a lot of imported goods. Uh, it's a lot of uh, joint ventures uh, where there is a big uh, M&E uh, lying behind, and often Nestle uh, lying uh, behind uh, most of the production, as far as I'm informed. Um, but clearly, it will eventually uh, increase the possibility of local producers in engaging in this interaction along this uh, value chain and maybe reap the benefits. So I agree on that. This was one particular, one particular example of that was what we found in, in Mozambique. This was work that, that John and I did as well. And um, it was um, very, it was local domestic firms. I don't know if we ever did the disaggregation by diaspora or not. I'm not sure if we could see that. No. I don't think the data allowed us to see that. So we're not sure, but they were, would have been classed as domestic firms that established and the minute they, the minute they established, they were exporting. And um, in terms of the policy implication of that, then you know one of the things I kind of mentioned um, in the presentation was that there is a clear problem accessing markets, accessing export markets. Um, so the knowledge of the markets of where you're going to export to appears to be a big constraint for local firms in terms of entering into those markets. Um, also trade logistics, um, actually accessing getting the material that are getting the goods to the port, for example. That's another very significant constraint for some of the domestic firms. So um, in terms of the policy, I think it's quite quite obvious in terms of selection into exporting. It's um, those kinds of constraints, but also capabilities themselves. And I think a lot of what we talk about comes down to the domestic capabilities um, and um, what kind of policies can we um, look at there in terms of building up those capabilities to, to be able to enter into export markets. There's a lot of work to be done domestically first. Thank you.